The olive tree analogy uh, or metaphor that Paul uses in Romans 11 verses 17 through 24 is quite a popular one. It's uh, used, uh, many ministries are named and businesses are named after it. And it has a long history of interpretation. So I want to talk a little bit today about what I think Paul means using this analogy, what he doesn't mean, and, uh, and how it's been uh, interpreted. For the most part, throughout history, this analogy is interpreted in a supersessionistic uh, manner, meaning supersessionism, meaning that there was Judaism, then Jesus and the apostles introduced something fundamentally different that superseded that and replaced it. And so the olive tree kind of represents this new thing, the church, into which Jew and Gentile now have created a third race, so to speak. And so recently a very popular teacher uh, made a little quip uh, that went something like, uh, Gentiles are no longer Gentiles in Christ and Jews are no longer Jews outside of Christ. And this kind of represents how the olive tree analogy has been understood as a supersession of Israel and the prophetic apocalyptic hope that they held at the time. And I don't think that's the case. I think Paul's arguing for the exact opposite thing in Romans 11 in general. Paul is arguing in Romans 11 that God's mercy extended to the Gentiles does not mean that, God, that the Jews have fallen and been forsaken, that God has changed the narrative. But rather, because of their trespass, mercy has been, salvation has been extended to the Jews. And so in that light, in verses 11 uh, to 16, in that light, verse 17, Paul introduces the olive tree analogy. Now, what I don't think Paul is trying to do is read, uh, be allegorical with, an, with this analogy, meaning each part of the analogy represents a specific thing and that relates to each other. I think it's more of a generic type metaphor that simply represents the hope of eternal life, the promises of hope, you know, Ephesians 2, that the Gentiles were without hope and without God, uh, separated from the hope of Israel. But now, because of Christ and the blood and the sacrifice, they have been brought near and they've been brought into the hope of eternal life. And that, that's what Paul is talking about. I think that's the case because that's what he's re he references in verse 15 uh, when he says that their acceptance will be life from the life from the dead, meaning the resurrection. And immediately following, he talks he concludes the olive tree analogy with all Israel will be saved in verse 26. And salvation in Paul's writing is uh, generally fits comfortably within how Jews viewed salvation at, in the first century. And that is salvation from the wrath to come, from the day of God and the day of wrath. So Paul references that in chapter 2, verse 5. You're storing up for yourselves wrath that will be expressed on the day of wrath. And, uh, and then, for example, chapter 5, verse 9, by his blood we've been uh, justified much more will be saved from the wrath to come. Uh, chapter 10, you know, if uh, with your mouth, how's it go? With your mouth, uh, you declare Jesus is Lord. With your heart, you believe uh, that he's uh, raised from the dead. Then you will be saved, assumedly from the wrath to come. And uh, Or chapter 8, when he talks about the creation groaning and us also with the Spirit, uh, that we're groaning for the redemption of our bodies and into this hope we're saved. The hope of the resurrection and eternal life saved from the wrath to come, the day of Yahweh. Or chapter 13, um, uh, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is om oh, almost gone. The day is at hand. So this, the framework that Paul is assuming is the framework that Jews generally held in the first century, the Jewish apocalyptic view of history. And that that's how he's using the olive uh, tree analogy is to simply reference the, the hope of eternal life, the resurrection, the day of God, the age to come, etc. 
the Jews were cultivated in these realities. The Gentiles were clueless because they didn't have the Torah or the prophetic literature. They just lived for this life, eat, drink, for tomorrow we die, etc. But now they have been brought into that hope and expectation. And so that's how Paul concludes in verse 25. It's, he kind of summarizes the olive tree analogy by saying, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it's written, the Redeemer will come from Zion. And so the olive tree analogy he summarizes with the Israel's experienced a hardness. Some have been broken off, you know, as he said earlier until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so you Gentiles, you don't define the tree. You don't define the covenants and the redemptive narrative. You're brought into a pre-existing understanding of history. You're brought into a tree that already exists. And so uh, God has done this in mercy and kindness until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and then all Israel will be saved. And so that phrase, all Israel will be saved, has a long history of debate and contention, but I think it fits most comfortably in a Jewish apocalyptic scenario, a simple first century view that historical scholars argue that all Israel being saved simply references the restoration of the 12 tribes, that 10 were lost, and on the day of God and the resurrection, God will gather all 12 back together to the land in the punishment of the wicked, the, re the reward of the righteous, etc. And so Jews in the first century viewed the Gentiles very literally according to the table of nations in Genesis 10. There's 70 of them. And when the fullness of those, the full number comes in, then the 12 tribes will be restored as is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. So I think that's all Paul has in mind is he's simply saying you Gentiles are a secondary narrative to a narrative that's pre-existed. The olive tree, the hope of eternal life is something that you're brought into. You didn't define it. You're just grafted into it and brought into that hope. And Paul th does kind of a reprise in chapter 15 of the same idea. You know, chapter 15, verse 8, he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So it's the same idea that the death of, of Jesus, his resurrection and ascension, didn't change the, the apostasies of some Jews, didn't change the narrative but God rather confirmed and affirmed the promises given to the patriarchs and the Gentiles have been extended mercy as a secondary narrative to the pre-existing one. And then he quotes, you know, Deuteronomy, a couple Psalms and Isaiah 11 to reinforce the idea that the Gentiles will be brought in to worship the God of Israel. And he concludes in chapter 15, verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And I think this is precisely what Paul has in mind about Gentiles being grafted in, is that they are drawing and receiving the sap, the nourishing sap of the hope of eternal life, all joy and peace in believing. And that that's his goal in correcting the Gentiles and their conceit and arrogance, thinking the story has changed. And he says, no, the story hasn't changed. Rather, you're brought into that hope as a secondary reality, as a secondary narrative, and the pre-existing one hasn't changed. So I hope that helps uh, kind of clarify the, the analogy that Paul uses with the olive tree and it's an exhortation for us to set our hope on that reality of the return of Jesus, the resurrection, the salvation of all Israel, the restoration of the kingdom, and the age to come. God bless.